Hello, folks. Uh, my name is AJ Stewart. I'm the manager of supplier diversity at CGLCC. Uh, if you don't know that by now, then where have you been all day? Um, so uh, just a couple uh, really quick reminders. A welcome to everyone who's joining us virtually. Um, and if you're watching this in a, uh, in a recorded version later, welcome as well. Uh, quick reminders uh, that you can find all of our speaker bios on the Feedloop website for the summit. Um, as well as while you're on there checking out those bios, don't forget to stop, and stop by and uh, uh, take a look and chat with our exhibitors as well, our virtual exhibitors. Uh, we also have networking rooms. So networking is not only in person this year. We have a whole virtual component to this uh, to this summit. So so please engage. You have a, a couple hours left to do that. There's some really great folks online as well. So don't forget to do that. Um, it is now my pleasure to uh, introduce the next uh, the next speakers. Um, Bill and Ted are going to take us on an excellent adventure. Um, in from one to many, creating performance by connecting people to purpose. So please uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Bill and Ted. And the crowd went mild. Yes. Um, thank you, thank you. I'm so excited to be here today. I am Bill Bill Williams. And if you want to grow your business and go from one to many, there's two things you're going to need. Number one, a strategy. And number two, some really good legal advice. Because you need to take care of not only yourself, but you also need to take care of your people. So I'm gonna cover that first part. I'm gonna talk about the strategy of going from one to many, and Ted's gonna come on up and give you some excellent legal advice for Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Are you ready to go? Let's make it happen. And so, simply wanna share with you a four-step process to help you go from one to many. And here it is. Step number one, what is your purpose? How are you connecting your people to your purpose, but also your purpose to your clients, your customers, those most important to you? Step number two, I want to encourage you to take a look at co-visioning. You are a leader. Uh, the only thing you need in order to be a leader, though, is a follower. And the very first question they're going to ask you, where are we going? So how do you ensure that you have followers that are going to the same place you want to go, that they're on the bus that you want to be driving? The third step, and where I want to spend a little bit more time today, is talking about your values in step number three. Finally, step number four, we'll take a look at your goals. We're going to take a look at your big goals, we're going to take a look at your little goals, and to help you get to the business that you really want to have, and then Ted's going to help you with your legal advice, all right? So stay tuned for the first 15 minutes or so, and then the legal advice is going to kick in. And so, step number one, the most important question that I have for you in regards to your purpose critical for you. You've already got a business. You want to grow it. The first question, though, is who is your most important customer? Really take a look at the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, if you will. Who are the 20% of your customers that generate 80% of your revenue? Those are your most important customers. But then the next key question is, what do they hire you to do? And it's not what you think it is. Now, these uh, slides for you, both mine and Ted's, are available for you. Just reach out to Andra and connect with her. She will make sure that you get all of the handouts from this presentation. Now, if your clients can hire you, as I said, they can probably fire you as well. And so be really careful about who it is that you're attracting as your most important customer. And I just want to give you two visuals to think about this. Number one, visualize, if you will, a Walmart customer. You got them in your head? You're good to go? Canadian All right. Uh, <laughs> Canadian, good question, Peter. Canadian or American, significant difference. But yeah, a Walmart customer. You got it in your mind. Now, come with me to downtown Toronto, Bloor Street, Yorkville. Head on up to Yorkdale if you want. Go out to Sherway Gardens and check out Holt Renfrew. Visualize a Holt Renfrew customer. I'm not judging either of them. I shop at both stores. But the critical question for you is, what customers are you attracting? Imagine if Holt Renfrew attracted Walmart customers. And imagine Walmart if they attracted Holt Renfrew customers. They are not going to have satisfied customers. They're going to have very dissatisfied customers. They will not have promoters. They're going to have detractors. So make sure that all of your marketing efforts, as you're growing and building your business, are focused towards the right customer for you, that most important customer. Remember, if they can hire you, they can fire you. And as soon as they fire you, all they need is social media and be concerned about your business. Step number one, who's your most important customer? What do they hire you to do? That is your purpose. But again, your purpose isn't what you think it is. 
Think about your accountant. What do you hire your accountant to do? And it's not just to complete your taxes. If you thought it was to complete your taxes, think about what you hired your accountant to do when the CRA shows up to audit your books. Now, again, think about why did you hire that accountant? And it wasn't just to process the paperwork. It was to ensure that all the paper was done correctly, accurately, effectively, so that you never get audited. So you don't really hire them for the math. You hire them for the confidence that you're not going to have anyone knocking on your door you don't want knocking on your door. All right, step number two, co-visioning. So your purpose, when it's delivered with excellence, that's your vision. Again, in order to be a leader, the only thing you need is a follower. So what I would challenge you to do in step number two, co-visioning, is to think about who are your most important stakeholders? Who are your key stakeholders? I would challenge you to think about not only your customers, but also think about your employees themselves. So depending on how big you want to get, who are the internal stakeholders that you'd have as well? And then think about your external stakeholders. Oftentimes in a corporate environment, I would challenge people to think about the senior leadership team, the external customer, the internal customer, and the team itself. Is that getting through to the people? Thank you so much, Dan. So yeah, way more than you need in this room here, but this is going virtually. So that's why he needs me to have the mic in my mouth. So again, when you're taking a look at your vision, who are the four key stakeholder groups that you have? Internal customers, external customers, your senior leadership team, and the team itself. And then challenge them to think about what do they want those groups to be saying about them two to five years from now? And have them simply draw a picture. And as soon as they draw that picture and they describe that picture to everybody, those are the keywords that you need as a leader of this business to come up with your vision. But what I know for sure is involvement breeds commitment. And the more involved your people are in creating your vision, the more committed they will be to executing on that vision. Think about your vision. That's step number two. But where I really wanted to spend some time today was talking about your values. And when I'm taking a look at values, there's a few statements that I just want to share with you, just baseline around what values actually are. So values are basic and fundamental beliefs that guide or motivate attitudes or actions. Pretty simple. Number two, values in a narrow sense is that which is good, desirable, or worthwhile to you and the organization. Remember, we're creating performance by connecting your people to your purpose. The third thing around values is they are the motive behind purposeful action. They are the ends to which we act and come in many, many forms. So I would challenge you as a small business owner to think about what are your top six values. On the table in front of you, you will find some blank paper, if you will, the Weston Hotels provided. Grab a sheet of that paper, if you would. Be so kind. Take one of those sheets of paper and fold it as if you're about to put it into an envelope to mail it to somebody. So almost that triple fold, if you will. And then fold that in half. Let me give you a demonstration. When you open that up, you should have six spots that you'd have available to you. And I'm actually going to invite you to tear it up into six equal size pieces. And what I want you to do with those six pieces is on each one of them individually, write down one of your top six values that you have for your organization. What are your current top six values? <laughs> the tearing exercise is taking a while. <laughs> It doesn't have to be perfect. No, it doesn't have to be perfect, but close is good. Close is good, it counts. Close counts in, in six values pieces of paper. And again, just write down your top six values. Some of them are gonna to come to your mind right away. Inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion, integrity. What are your top six values? If you want, you can Google and get a huge long list of what corporate values might be. 
And if you got close to six, these are things you really feel proud about. These are the things you feel good about. This is the price of admission to be on your team. If you want to work within your organization, or you want people to work within your organization, they must have these values. And again, just write down one value per square piece of paper that you created. Tear them up. We're looking good. And once you've got those six values written out, again, just lay them in front of you so you can see all six values right there in front of you. Good news is you got six. The bad news, six are too many. So it is June 2nd, and we are here in Toronto. It's a hot, sunny day. I don't know where you are out there in the virtual world, but it's a hot, sunny day here in Toronto. Believe it or not, we are going to have a snowball flight fight right here in this room. So grab one of those values which are no longer a part of your team values, crunch it up into a ball, and throw it at me. Take one of your values, crunch it up into a snowball, and throw it at me. I will clean up the room later. Don't you worry about a thing. Toss it at me. You're down to five. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Oh, Peter. Whoa. Awesome. Over my head. I love it. Oh, well done. Let's not poke an eyeball out. All right. Good stuff. Okay. So now you're down to five. Guess what? You got to get rid of one more. Grab the next one that you're willing to let go of. Crunch it up into a snowball. Throw it at me one more time. I know it's getting painful, isn't it? <laughs> I am losing whatever friends I had in this room before I started talking. Thank you. Awesome. I'm not even going to try to catch these snowballs. You're down to four now. You got your top four. Awesome. You made it over the table. Top four values. Guess what? You got to do it one more time. So grab one last value that you are willing to let go of. Attention to detail, customer focus, integrity, money. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Steve. I got it. Cool. Toss it at me. So there you go. You have your top three values. Now, this is really critical. This is awesome because to be on your team, this is the price of admission. You will need to talk to Ted a whole lot more <laughs> after today if you don't take this next step. Because the thing is that all too often we hire people for skill and we hope that they have our values. More often than not, when you're terminating employees, it's probably a values gap than it is a skill gap. You can teach them how to do things, but if they don't have that customer focus, if they don't have that attention to detail, if their job is to clean the office and they don't clean the corners, there's a problem there. So what are the values that you have? Now, the next thing that's most critical for me about your values is that they not be platitudes on your website. It's beautiful when you've got a great web designer and they put our corporate values up there, but your values need to be verbs. I need to experience your values. And so the big question I have for you here, what you need to understand on the back of that small piece of paper is as demonstrated by what? How will I as your customer experience that value? And let me just tell you a, a quick story about me and my sister, because we both value family. But my sister Allie lives in the city that I grew up in, Kamloops, British Columbia. I live here in Toronto. Now, regularly, I travel for business. And so on one occasion, I said, hey, Allie, I'm coming to Kamloops. Let's get together. Now, if you've never been to Kamloops, British Columbia, it's a five-hour flight from Toronto to Vancouver, usually a one-hour connection and a one-hour flight from Vancouver to Kamloops. So I'm investing seven hours just to get there. And I called her and said, hey, Allie, let's get together. She said, sure, let's go for coffee. I'm, I'm spending seven hours on a plane. You got 20 minutes for me? Really? Seriously? However, I can tell you on the daily multiple times, she will text me. She will send me PowerPoint slideshows with puppies and kittens. And if I really loved all of my friends, I should send that email to everyone. Her demonstration of family value is multiple contacts throughout the day. My demonstration of family value is that when we're together, there is no empty seat at the table. So you could see how my sister and I could easily begin to get into arguments over you don't value family only because we don't have clarity around what the value actually means. Now, throughout these two years of COVID, I've been doing a lot of studying. And the one study I've been working on a lot is confidence. 
And a lot of my corporate clients that come for coaching ask me, you just need to build their confidence up. I'm like, I would love to help them with their confidence, but I can't do that. Because confidence isn't something you can work on. My experience has been that confidence is actually an outcome. And it's an outcome of clarity. So if you as a leader can be clear with your team around what our purpose is, why do we exist? What is our vision, our purpose, when delivered with excellence? That's our vision. And then what are the values, the price of admission to be on this team? You've got to be able to demonstrate those values. So really make sure you know not only what you truly value, but how you'd be able to catch your people doing it right. And constantly be out there looking for them, delivering on those values, demonstrating those values to your customers day in and day out. Now, the next step. After step number three here, I'm just going to bring you home and turn you over to Ted so you can get some really great legal advice, is your goals. What are your goals as a business? And the number one and probably the oldest organization development tool in order to help you get there is a SWOT analysis. And I say SWOT, and you say not. I don't want to do a SWOT. And i got to tell you, many times I've worked with senior executives of big organizations, and they say, no, Bill, we don't need to do a SWOT. I'm like, give me 15 minutes on the agenda. And they do. And then what I find out after we started the SWOT analysis, they're like, Bill, keep this going. I've never heard this stuff. This is the best stuff I've ever heard before. Don't stop it. Let it go. So rather than the 15 minutes, we convert that into at least an hour-long conversation where they learn so much about their business. But here's the thing. SWOT is sexy. That's the only reason they call it a SWOT analysis, is that it's sexy. So I don't actually say, let's do a SWOT. <laughs> I say, let's do TOES, which doesn't sound sexy at all, does it? <laughs> Especially when it's T-O-W-S. Um, it's really not a sexy statement at all. But why do I say that? Because this is the way that you should really be doing it. Take a look at the threats that you're experiencing out there in your community. Based on those threats, what opportunities does that create for you? Knowing the threats and the opportunities, what are the weaknesses of you and your team? And that's not a bad thing. It's just an opportunity for you to get better. But even more importantly then, what are the strengths that you have available to you? So here when we're taking a look at the SWOT analysis, opportunities and threats are external to you and the business that you're building. Hidden inside each opportunity, though, is a threat. And each threat also offers a new opportunity. You just need to get creative about what you're doing and just attract really brilliant people to work with you. The other side of it is strengths and weaknesses are actually internal to your organization. And so the question for you here, again, hidden each, inside each strength is a weakness. This I know to be true because I live here in Toronto uh, and I live up in the Stockyards District, which is basically just at the foot of Black Creek Drive. And every time I ride past and down Black Creek Drive, I drive past Photography Road. And no one even knows. <laughs> I got a weird look of my Photography Road. Where's Photography Road? It's in Toronto, but it's called Photography Road because that's where the Kodak plant used to be. You see, Kodak focused on development and film. How many of you have recently had a picture developed at the drugstore? Yeah, you know, <laughs> we're looking at our iPhones, but we're not looking at photographs being developed. So watch out that your strength doesn't actually become a weakness. And then leverage um, Isa Berlman's uh, ideas here of the hedgehog concepts. And so the very first question you should be looking at with your team is what are we deeply passionate about doing? Number two, what can we be the best in the world at? And then finally, number three, what drives your economic engine? Where those three things come together, those are the goals you should be great creating. And based on the work of Good to Great and Jim Collins, those are your BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. So that's what you want to be looking at. What are your top three goals? My very first job outside of, of McDonald's, uh, sorry, outside of my paper route was McDonald's. And it's been a long time since I worked at McDonald's, but I can still tell you what the top three goals of McDonald's were. Any other Ronnie alumni in this room? Virtually anyone? Anyone? No one? The top three goals of McDonald's are QSC. Quality, service, and if you have time to lean, you have time to clean. Quality, service, and cleanliness, the top three goals of McDonald's. So just be aware of that. What are the top three goals of your organization? That's what you want everyone to be focused on all the time. And then to create a goal statement. 
That goal statement should be a verb, a measure, from what to what, and by when. And here what we're looking at, an example, increased customer satisfaction from 85 to 90% by fiscal year end. A simple example of what to do. All right, we're getting close to finishing off your strategy. The next thing we need to take a look at, aside from your big goals, what are your little goals? And little goals are your best bet that you will accomplish your big goal. Because you see, your big goal you probably won't know until you get to the end of that fiscal year. Your little goals are the best bets that you're going to make it there. So a few things to take a look at in order to make sure that that happens. What obstacles could you face? What, is the, what do the best actually do? And is it actually innovative? Actually innovative what you're trying to do. Is it new and different than anybody else is doing? So little goals are predictive of your success. They can be influenced by your team. And you can actually get the data. It's got to be quick. It's got to be like the speedometer on your car. When you get that police siren behind you, you know instantly you were speeding, you're busted, away you go. That's what you want your little goals to look like. And so, I'm Bill Williams. I wanted to help you create performance by connecting people to purpose. But now that you've got the right people on the team, how do you make sure that you take care of your business and also take care of your people? With that, Ted, come and tell them. Thanks, Bill. That was great. Um, I got to admit, I haven't been in front of sort of a you know in-person audience for quite some time, and uh, so thanks for joining this adventure with me as I you know speak to people directly without a desk and a computer and speaking to a camera and so forth. Although talking to a judge is a whole lot less exciting than than talking to all of you. So this is uh, this is fantastic to be in person. So um, as Bill talked about, when you develop or once you've developed your purpose purpose, your vision, your values, and you're looking at assembling your team, uh, it's important to consider uh, sort of managing that team from a legal perspective. So uh, I am a employment perfect, thanks so much, excellent. Uh, I'm an uh, exclusively employment and human rights lawyer. Uh, I practice only in those areas. Uh, and the, you know, employment law has all sorts of rabbit holes and speed bumps. So it's important to be aware of those. By no means, you know, should you leave here thinking you're going to know it all or take it all with you. But if I can sort of help sort of sharpen your legal antenna or sort of spidey sense around some of these issues, uh, we can navigate some somewhat choppy waters a bit more easily. Uh, the old disclaimer, uh, none of this is legal advice. <laughs> it's all legal information. I'm happy to speak with any of you afterwards to customize something specific to your particular questions and so forth. But uh, by all means, uh, this is all uh, information to be, uh, you know, to be used, considered, and so forth. So I start with sort of the holy grail of employment law, which was a decision uh, in 1987 by the Supreme Court of Canada. I'm going to read this one in full, the others I won't. Uh, but essentially, uh, Justice Dixon in 1987 said this, work is one of the most fundamental aspects in a person's life, providing the individual with a means of financial support and as importantly, a contributory role in society. A person's employment is an essential component of his or her sense of identity, self-worth, and emotional well-being. Accordingly, the conditions in which a person works are highly significant in shaping the whole compendium of psychological, emotional, and physical elements of a person's dignity and self-respect. Uh, this is heady stuff, right? Uh, big, uh, broad latitudes. And the reason I share this uh, quote is that it's important to recognize that given the importance of the employment relationship and a person's employment to their self-indebtedity, you can be sure that the employment relationship is highly regulated and very closely governed. So dabbling in employment law is not something I would recommend you do. And by all means, reach out to a paralegal or a lawyer to assist you in making decisions relating to your employees and your, your workforce. So my goal today is to sort of cover off three planks within the employment relationship. Firstly is worker classification, which is, is your worker or are your, is your team uh, you know, sort of uh, built through employees or independent contractors and why it's an important distinction? Uh, the employment agreement and key elements within an effective employment agreement and why we should have one, and an employee handbook, rationales and, uh, and key elements there as well. So we'll start with worker classification, which again is the distinction between an independent contractor uh, and an employee. I'm sure many in this room um, have heard of and are aware of individuals who sort of take the approach of, I don't want to be caught up in employer obligations, I'm just going to hire an independent contractor. 
perfect. And we think that the job is done, and we're off the hook uh, on things like vacation pay, overtime, leaves, discipline, uh, all the rights under the Employment Standards Act, uh, and entitlements at termination, for example. Uh, this is a false security blanket. And for all the reasons that Justice Dixon in 1987 said employment is critically important, given the rise of independent contractors, uh, given that uh, employers or principals prefer to be off the hook of employee obligations, the court has taken a closer look at individuals and how they work and if they are correctly classified as an independent contractor or in fact they're an employee. Uh, and this is important because more recently uh, enforcement measures by the Ministry of Labor to protect the most vulnerable workers. You are probably familiar with the Uber class action or uh, you know, food delivery individuals, uh, that whole service industry and, and, and now digital workers are all or often being regarded as independent contractors when in fact they're employees and the courts are giving them employee rights. <clears throat> Worker classification uh, was addressed by the Supreme Court of Canada uh, in 2001, and you'll see there the bolded line in the decision, which we call SAGAZ in the business, uh, is the central question is whether the person who has been engaged to perform the services is performing them as a person in business on his own account. I apologize that everything's on the, I apologize on behalf of the court that everything's on the gender binary. Um, the, the, the Sagaz decision looks at the level of control, whether the worker hires their own helpers, and the degree of financial risk and degree of responsibility, as well as opportunity for profit. So essentially what Sagaz, and as it evolved uh, through the control test uh, in a later decision in 2008 called Lazy Boy, uh, is looking at essentially what distinguishes an independent contractor from a worker? And signs of an independent contractor are things such as uh, the person carrying on business for themselves. They take on some financial risk. There's a greater sense of reward or profit in taking on the engagement or participating as a worker with this principle. Uh, <clears throat> And in addition, as over, over time, the test or the sort of the considerations and factors to look at that the court uh, applies are things like tools, when, where, and how we work, okay? So if you have a worker and they're an independent contractor, but you actually are the, you determine where they work, how they work, you provide them with a computer or the tools uh, through which they can work, um, they have a set base sort of uh, calculation for compensation that has no variables around chances to, to increase profit or even take on a financial risk, that starts to look and talk and walk like an employee and not so much uh, an independent contractor, okay? So it's a test to be, to be aware of and, and to apply. <clears throat> Now, there's also a new term, just to make things even more gray and difficult. Uh, there's a new uh, concept called the dependent contractor. So if you have an independent contractor, in a decision from the Ontario Court of Appeal in 2019 called Thurston, if your independent contractor um, is in fact working exclusively for you or the vast majority of their business is drawn from your contract, they now look and feel more like an employee or sort of this medium term or interim term uh, on the spectrum called the dependent contractor. So it's also something to be, uh, to be mindful of. I'm gonna switch next to talk about the employment agreement and why are employment agreements important? Um, firstly, uh, they are not simply boilerplate. What you see in an employment contract is not just something necessarily that's been pulled offline or it's standard across the board. Employment contracts are uh, uh, customized specifically for the respective employer. And generally speaking, employment contracts drafted by the employer are drafted in such a way to benefit the employer and to reduce their liability, okay? So as an employee, you shouldn't look at, if you're ever looking at a contract from the perspective of an employee, don't think that it's simply there because it has to be there. Uh, it's there specifically to protect the employer and it's, you know, most employment agreements are meant to be negotiated. Sometimes they can be, sometimes they can't be. Uh, and the fine, fine print matters. It's really important to look closely at, empo at employment agreements. So I'm gonna cover off some, some key inclusions or considerations. And the first is probationary period. So here in Ontario under the Employment Standards Act, the Employment Standards Act says that employers can impose probationary periods. That doesn't mean that they're automatic. So the employment contract has to specifically say 
the employee shall be subject to a pr probationary period of three months, six months, whatever that period might be, okay? That's important to, to emphasize. Uh, another consideration is, do you want your employee to be fixed term or indefinite? Sometimes we think about fixed term contracts as more manageable because they're gonna expire after six months. And so if, if the fit isn't right, if it's not working out, if the, if the values aren't shared, you have an easy exit. To some extent, that is true, but more often than not, regrettably, uh, I do represent clients, employers, who have not renewed the fixed term agreement. It's lapsed, and now you're outside of any contract agreement because you've gone even one day over what was, extent, what was intended to be the expiry of that fixed term contract, and you're in the wild, wild west of employment rights which favor the employee. Okay, so it's important to be really mindful and watch your calendar to avoid a lapse if you do choose to go down the, the road of a fixed term contract. Uh, layoff clauses, employment lawyers like myself all learned hard lessons <laughs> from the pandemic when our clients wanted to lay off employees. Uh, you can lay off employees similar to the probationary period that is allowed under the Employment Standards Act, for example, here in Ontario, here in Ontario rather, you can lay off employees. However, there has to be a term of that, that where both parties agree to it as part of the employment agreement. We mostly saw layoff clauses applying to individuals who work in, you know, seasonable, seasonal rather, industries, not sort of across the board. The pandemic has changed that, of course. Uh, and brand new, hot off the presses. This rarely happens in law because it's a very slow moving <laughs> sort of body and institution. Uh, as of yesterday, here in Ontario, non-compete clauses are void. The Working for Workers Act uh, passed by the Doug Ford government in 2021, uh, parts of which have come into, um, into force over the course of time, uh, came into force yesterday on, um, uh, on non-compete clauses. So if you are looking to try and limit your exposure and limit your employee's ability to take what they've learned uh, to an, um, uh, their next employee at the termination of employment, you have to be very careful about how you structure that now. Um, it does allow, uh, as the, uh, the screen says, it does allow for some restrictive covenants. So for example, you can limit or inhibit a employee from taking other employees with them, for example. And of course, you can protect your own confidential information, which is your work, labor, and effort. But they you know, no longer, for example, you know, little Bill didn't have to, you know, limit himself from going across the street and working from Wendy's, uh, if he so chose, once, once McDonald's, uh, the McDonald's career expired. Um, and then lastly and most importantly, uh, because I spend the majority of my practice on this, uh, is the importance of the termination clause. I'm going to next go to a really scary slide, uh, but take a deep breath, we're going to walk through it together. There's a question, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a question from the floor about uh, the exception to the non-compete clauses, which is part of a sale and sale of a business. The ex exception there is that if you have purchased a business uh, from another individual, okay, and that individual subsequently becomes an employee of the new corporation, okay, of the, the buying corporation, a non-compete clause can be imposed then on that employee. And that's largely because that individual, given that they were the, you know, the president and the, or the sole shareholder of that respective business, they'll have significant sway and influence uh, in the event that they were to leave. So that's the one exception that's allowed under the new act um, uh, to the, the non-compete clauses being void. Yeah. Um, the non-compete clause, can you got a non-compete clause that applies to employees um, and that first sheet, but does that also pertain to executive employees? Yes. So, so non-compete clauses against executive employees are also void, unless they, they get into that one small loophole. Okay. Uh, and so lastly, termination clauses. I'm going to go to the next big scary slide. Here we go. Um, we talk about severance here in Ontario and many other provinces, okay? And some severances can feel really scary because all of a sudden uh, you have some exposure as an employer at the time that you want to fire an employee because the fit isn't there, the values don't quite align as you had hoped and expected that they would. Uh, <coughs> breaking this down, you'll see two columns on the left. And these are mandatory obligation uh, or mandatory payouts under the Employment Standards Act here in Ontario, okay? One is called, on the furthest left, termination pay, uh, which is a maximum of eight weeks. 
Statutory severance pay, which is a special little sort of um, basket which only applies to employees who have been with their employer for more than five years, okay, and where that employer's annual payroll exceeds two and a half million dollars. That's another week per year of service, okay, to a maximum of 26 weeks. The big scary monster where you hear about some of these decisions where so-and-so got fired and they got two years of severance and so, or something of that sort and they sued and they got a bundle. That's all under common law notice period, okay, on the furthest right, and that is determined by judges, okay? And here in Ontario, it's by the Ontario Superior Court or the Ontario Court of Appeal. And you do see in some cases where the individual's length of service or age uh, <coughs> um, or income uh, can, it can hit 24 months or even more. Uh, many decisions don't hit that high a number, but it's possible, and so even though you're you know, you might be hiring today for what you think might be a one or two year employee. Before you know it, a couple decades pass, that person's still with you and dedicated and you've chosen that you want to terminate their employment. This is some exposure and consideration you want to consider first. And the test that's run for a common law notice period is from a decision called Bartle, which is cited there on the bottom right hand corner. Now, the next slide, I have a big X to that. And that's because you can structure an employment contract that contracts out of your common law notice period. And it allows employers to hire confidently individuals with the confidence of knowing that they don't have this big common law exposure at the end of the day. That doesn't mean that you have to be heartless at the time of terminating an employee, okay? You can still offer them some severance or you could come up with a calculation. You can say to the employee, look, uh, I don't want to be you know, completely unfair here, but I just can't take on this exposure of you know, up to 24 months. So let's come up with sort of an in-between. That's all possible. That's only permitted, though, if you have an ironclad enforceable employment contract. And I'm, I'm going to venture a guess that nine times out of 10, you're not going to get that if you just download it off of a Google search. Okay. <clears throat> really quickly, a valid termination provision which limits those entitlements at termination of employment um, has to, amongst other things, have key, four key features. It can't be in breach here in Ontario of the, um, of the Employment Standards Act. It has to clearly remove the employee's common law entitlements, which was that red column I showed you before. It has to be properly implemented to be enforceable. And what does properly implemented mean? It means, for example, that you have to have your employee sign it before they start working, okay? Sometimes we have an employee start on Monday and you say, oh yeah, let's take, a bit, let's take care of this paperwork on Thursday. That's an immediate easy out for me and my clients if I'm representing an employee to say this isn't enforceable because they already started working under a contract prior to you having them execute it, okay? And then lastly, it can't be ambiguous. Sometimes ambiguity helps us as lawyers, <laughs> for the lawyers that are in the room, but uh, when you're limiting an individual's entitlements, you really don't want to be uh, ambiguous. Uh, lastly, we will cover off the employee handbook. Uh, why is an employee handbook important? I would say it's important for you as an employment lawyer because it helps to be a bit of an extension of yourself in writing, and it makes it really clear so you're not playing a game of he said, they said uh, early in the employment relationship. Okay, uh, it can also help employers avoid or reduce liability, okay, when the relationship goes sideways. And it doesn't always happen, but it can happen, as some people have experienced in this room, and best to be protected. Uh, and there's also examples where it's mandatory. So for, for example, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act here in Ontario, as well as the Ontario Human Rights Code, you actually are required to have uh, provisions of an, employment agree uh, of an employment agreement or a handbook or employee policies that help to protect and uphold safe workplaces and discrimination-free workplaces. <clears throat> uh, it can also, for example, uh, an, an effective handbook will outline imp workplace investigations. So it will allow for an individual to make a complaint where there's been an instance of harassment or discrimination or workplace violence and outlines what the employer's obligations are within that. It can also address, for example, the handling of confidential information to reinforce that you want your work labor and effort to stay within the company and not be shared outside of the company. Uh, use of company property. Uh, we might all assume that your employees shouldn't be using their computers or equipment or vehicles to, you know, to, for personal needs or reasons. But in fact, if that's not outlined, that's not it's, it's not assumed, so it needs to be in there. Anti-harassment and sexual harassment policies are important. 
Workplace violence policies are important. Uh, Anti-discrimination policies are also important. Drugs and alcohol at the workplace. Sometimes if you have after work drinks on a Friday, uh, you're gonna wanna shape and make sure that your, work, your policies and your handbooks outline that you know, sometimes alcohol on the workplace is okay, but it's not okay on a general basis, okay? If that's not clearly stated, it can get blurry if there are ever drinks at the office. Uh, we lot, learned a lot from the pandemic about working from home. What does working from home look like? Is it a right or is it a privilege? Uh, is it, uh, and what sort of expectations are still maintained by the employer when working at home? Social media policy. If your employee tweets or uh, posts something really egregious that reflects badly on the company, and you want to terminate or discipline on that basis, it's much easier to do so if there's a provision in the handbook that clearly says this is not cool conduct at, at this place of employment. And then new also as of yesterday is the right to disconnect, which means that after hours your employees are not expected to respond to communications, correspondence, emails, etc. This is a bit more on dis disconnecting from work. Uh, it was implemented here or passed in Ontario uh, and implemented as of yesterday to help sort of unblur those lines between personal and professional life that were created by the pandemic. Those are the three key planks that I think are important to, that you consider uh, when you're uh, creating and building your team and growing from one or to introducing a department to many. Uh, thanks very much for listening. We and Bill and I both, oh yeah, thank you. And if there's time, Bill and I both welcome any questions that, that folks might have. I will just say uh, there, we are at time for the sessions overall. Okay, so no questions. <laughs> just, if people don't want to go into their break, um, they could, but the, the next session, the next week, will begin at noon. Okay. Uh, so, questions ish. Yes. It's more of, well, I'm going to say generally, interpretively, it's more of the latter. The regulations supporting the act don't actually build out what this policy is supposed to look like. It simply says that if you have 25 or more employees, you need to have a policy. What does the policy say? It's, <laughs> it's really at the discretion of the employer. Um, but yes, it would be more around and focused on communication and correspondence versus, say, working on a project or working on a presentation or you know, any other overtime uh, um, uh, rights that your employee might have. So for instance, if I turn around and say, hey, you know, just an FYI for tomorrow, take a look, you know, this is before tomorrow, but you babysit it at 505, it's like, you know, all of a sudden you might have this, like, you're not allowed to send that to me. Is that, is it, you know, allowed to send it to me, or basically I don't have to respond to it after five? I think it's the latter. You don't have to respond to it. It doesn't prevent you from, from, uh, corresponding, it's just that they don't have to respond. They can disconnect Are the employee. That, uh, even though if you were responding to make it constructive, okay, like to say that you were in a culture where you were regularly forced to respond and therefore they're violating the law. Yeah, uh, so watch the space because uh, I think we'll see, right? It's it's new law and so I think the, the case law and jurisprudence that comes out in coming years based on breaches of the policies will be will be something to see. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, agreed. It's something to watch, because it's new law, yeah. Other questions, or questions for Bill? You can protest, uh, 
Uh, and you can refuse, for example, to, if there's a, a, an, an acknowledgement form, for example, that's required, you can refuse to sign the acknowledgement. Um, you might run the risk of discipline or, you know, termination of employment, but at that point then, the handbook wouldn't govern. It's also fair to say that um, the handbook is an extension of the employment contract. It's not a replacement of the employment contract. And courts and um, third parties who are trying to assess what determines and governs the employment relationship will look first to that first document that was signed between the parties. Now, at the time of, say, a promotion or an increase in pay, there may have been a subsequent sort of moment in time where there's a, a new uh, agreement. And, there's all sorts of ways to dispute or, or assess whether it's enforceable or not. But the handbook alone wouldn't necessarily replace everything that's in that first governing document. Yeah. Excellent. Enjoy break, everybody. Thanks for listening.